Hi, this video is for developers that are writing applications for the Flipper Zero. In particular, it's the sub gigahertz receive and transmit functionality that we're going to be talking about, how to add into your own application. So if you've written a Flipper Zero application and it's maybe a single player game or something, then this is going to help you understand how to transmit packets out, little messages that are like 60 bytes, and then how to receive messages from other Flipper Zeros that are 60 bytes. And you can use this to say, here's where I'm moving on this game board or that kind of information. Hopefully come up with some creative ideas for multiplayer games uh, based on this information. I'm basically gonna be reading the GitHub. I'll put link down below. If you don't wanna listen to me, just basically read the slides, feel free to go to the GitHub link and read it yourself. The HackRF section talks about how if you don't have a second Flipper Zero, which I don't, you can use a HackRF1 to record what the fl Flipper is broadcasting, and then you can also use it to transmit back to the Flipper for testing. So that's how I'm testing what the second Flipper would do. Once the in-stock happens, I'll probably buy a second Flipper. Let's talk about some of the key concepts for sub gigahertz. So the first thing is when we say RX, what we're talking about is receiving on a frequency less than one gigahertz. Usually those frequencies are like 315 megahertz or 433 megahertz, or maybe in like the eight to 900 megahertz range, somewhere in there. Transmit TX is when we're sending to another flipper. RX is when we're receiving from a flipper. Different countries and regions have different frequencies that you're allowed to broadcast on. There's a link when you click on allowed to find out for your country what frequencies those are. The Flipper firmware by default knows and will have a method that will tell you if you're allowed to broadcast or not. I've found that typically if you use 433.92 or 315, those are two numbers that will work in either one. If you allow one or the other, usually that covers most countries can at least do one of those. So if your app lets you switch between the two, uh, the demo is hard-coded to 433, so you'd have to actually recompile it if you wanted 315 megahertz. When you're sending data, you can send whatever you want, and it's usually about 60-ish bytes. And so my recommendation is if we're all going to start sending data on the same frequencies, that we have a way to tell if the message is for us or if it's for some other application. That way we can have multiple people playing multiplayer games in a room and we're not gonna have all this kind of like your app crashes because it gets unexpected uh, packets. So what I'm proposing, which you know anyone can come up with a different idea, that's great. The beginning of the message has the name of the app. Um, since we only get 60 bytes, I recommend we try to keep the names pretty small but also kind of unique. Uh, and then I end it with a colon. And the reason why is that way I can say, does the packet start with this message? And I don't want, if someone else has the same name, but it has a, like a two at the end or whatever, I don't want it to match with like, yeah, it started with it. So by putting a colon there, it won't match. Next is the purpose of the message. So this is a single byte. I've been using an actual character there. So I will use like a T for a, if I'm sending a tone in my app or a, C for a count or, you know, M for a move or whatever. So you can, what that is, is, is dependent on what kind of game you're doing. For each game, those characters will be different, but the recommendation is to use one byte that represents what that packet is. That way, when you can receive the packet, you can decide like, oh, I got a contact information packet. I don't care about that right now. So I'm just gonna ignore that packet. The next thing is the major version, you know, if you're only gonna have one version, I guess you could skimp out on this, but typically we end up in versioning pretty quickly. So by sending a major version, then your application can handle clients that are sending that are on older versions of your game. Um, again, I'm recommending just a single byte. I think most games will last, you know, a, a hundred different versions is quite a bit. And after that, you could always change your unique name to get more space. Um, or you could use a certain character like lowercase z means the character after is also part of the version. <laughs> um, yeah. And then next is any kind of parameters. 
if all you're trying to say is this message that says the person pressed the down button, you don't need to send any data. But if, like in my case, when I pressed the OK button, I wanted to send a four digit count, I was sending the next four characters were the count number. And I sent that as just text, so it's really easy to understand what's in that packet. You don't have to send it as text. You can use, you know, the bytes are the bytes, so you can use them that way. I think text makes things easier, especially in debugging. Uh, then I'm putting a colon as a delimiter. That lets me know that we're done with the game parameter data. And then finally is the name of the flipper that's sending the packet. That way, if there's multiple people playing, maybe we have a massive multiplayer game where all names are accepted, or maybe we have one where you're playing with one person and you can drop out anything that's not from the flipper that you're playing your game with. Um, that way two people can play the same game in the same room and not interfere with each other. And finally, yeah, it's like I said, it's the name of the flipper. And the way to get that is with this method call, you can get the name of the flipper. Um, they can, of course, customize firmware, which will change the flipper name to something custom. And then of course the flipper could be transmitting any packets that someone created. Uh, so you should expect to get malformed data, not just because of RF interference, but also because people may be maliciously trying to send you interesting data uh, that, that may cause your application to misbehave. All right, so with that, that's basically the key concepts if you're gonna do sub gigahertz sending and receiving. Um, so now let's talk about how do you actually make your application send and receive. The next video that I'm making will actually be uh, where I walk through the, the demo and but go ahead and feel free to copy any of the code that's in the tutorial into your own application um, as long as however you do it isn't changing my requirements um, i'm totally cool with that on the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import the library so again the goal is you are a developer writing a flipper application so hopefully this stuff looks really familiar to you um, so the first thing we're going to do is this pound include and we're going to put that at the top of our files. And we're going to include this library of sub gigahertz TX, which was transmitted in RX, which is received worker H. Next, we're going to define uh, how big the packets are allowed to be. I think the CC1101, if that's how you say it, I think that chip has a limit of around 64. Um, so I'm recommending 60, but you know, post in the comments if you know what the real number should definitely be. And we're going to use that later on so that if we make a packet that's bigger, we're going to truncate to that size. You could obviously do some validation to make sure that everything that you want to send is always smaller than that. Next is that defining the name of your application that's going to be the beginning of what you're going to send in your packets. So go ahead and do that. And then you're going to create a callback method and this callback method, rx event callback, that takes a context, is going to get invoked every time a message is received from the flipper. So every time the flipper gets something on the frequency that you've specified, and it's in a format that it can decode, it's going to send you those characters. Um, so you're going to get invoked here. When that happens, all you know is that there's a message. The callback doesn't have anything else in it. What you're going to do is queue some kind of event to tell your application that it needs to go read that data, find out what it is. In my case, I'm saying event data detected is what you want to put in the queue. Depending on how you've done your messaging queues, you may want a different naming, it's totally fine. Then in the entry point of your application, so when you're starting up, you want to have a frequency, again, the frequencies depend on what's allowed. So I'm using 433 megahertz, which is totally legit in my country. You may want to do 315 megahertz, or you may even want the application to let the user choose the megahertz. And this number is in hertz. The next is to find out if it is allowed. So since we're going to be transmitting, you can call this method and say, is it allowed to transmit on this frequency? And if it's not, then maybe you want to switch the frequencies. So I'm actually thinking about updating the demo app to have 315 and 433. It'll start on 433. If it's not allowed, it'll go to 315. 
And then when the app starts, it'll tell you which frequency it's on. And then obviously you'll have to be able to let people choose which one. If they're playing with another user, they can agree on that. Check, so that's that. Next, we wanna allocate all the data for the worker. So we just call sub gigahertz TXRX worker alloc, and we wanna save that in our context. Then we want to start the worker. So hopefully you're doing similar stuff already in your, in your main application entry point. We're gonna start the worker, which is sub gigahertz TXRX worker start. You pass in the, the thing you allocated and you pass in the frequency that you specified and you'll get back either true or false. If it's false, then you need to clean up all your resources and exit or maybe ask someone for the other frequency that they wanna try, something like that. Uh, the demo application just exits. Okay, so this should say register a callback method and basically what we want to do is call sub gigahertz txrx worker set callback have read read i'm not sure and what that does is it takes that worker that we have above and then it takes the name of our callback which as you'll recall was right here that's what it's going to call and then it takes a context that we want to set so this is your application context where you stored any kind of information that you'd want so that's going to be able to do the queuing right so as long as this context can access the queue you're good i'll fix this to say register a callback and then all the apps for the cli sub gigahertz that i looked at turn off charging of the flipper i don't know why but i figure if they do it maybe we should do it suppress charge increments a counter and it stops charging when we re-enable charge it decrements the counter. If you get back to zero, it starts charging. So that's what that's doing. Stop being charging, I don't know why. But at that point, we're good to go. So that's it for basically, if we receive a message, our callback will get invoked and we will cue that there was something that we received. So now that we have that, obviously when our app is all done, we are going to want to free the resources and turn back on charging. So this would be at the very end of your program when you're exiting is see if it's running if it is stop it and then free the resources and then decrement that counter so that there's a chance that the charging is going to happen again if you forget this then your flipper is not going to get charged uh, until you reboot so be sure that all your exit paths are turning charging back on hopefully i'm right i could be wrong all right, so moving on. We talked about, we got this message and we queued up a thing that said, hey, we received some data. So now we're gonna write a method that actually receives the data and figures out what that data is. And so what we have is an array of up to 60 and we clear it out with all zeros. And then we try to do a read which is sub gigahertz TX RX worker read, uh, passing in that thing we allocated, which we would get from our demo context. And it will then s put that content into this message that we pass and up to this amount of bytes. And then it returns how many bytes were actually copied into the message. Uh, but what I've been seeing is it's also null terminating my message. So I haven't had to actually use this length. Maybe it's a good practice to, if the length is here, to always make sure the very max length or here we put a null, just, just to make sure we don't buffer overflow. Um, I'll update the demo app to do that. Cool, so at this point, the message is in here that got transmitted and you've received it and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, my recommendation is to parse it out, look at what it is, and then if it's something that you need to act more on, you should probably queue a message saying, here's what I wanna do. I wanna, the other player made a move and they requested to move to the middle square. So I'll queue that event and then my main application will see that queued event and then actually do the moving. So I wouldn't do all your programming logic here. I would just parse it, validate it, don't trust what you get. Uh, and when it's good, cue and message to yourself with the values you care about. 
and then down in your uh, QGET switch in your main application loop that's processing all your messages, when you get that data detected that we put up here, we queued that in when we got that callback. So you wanna add code in your main loop that says, when I get one of those, call this method. Um, and what that'll do is, you know, you'll get the message, you'll go there, you'll queue the thing, you'll go here, you'll get the message, you'll parse it, you'll queue another thing, you'll go back here, and then you'll typically then react on like event remote player moved or whatever events you create for your game or your application. So that's it. At that point, we are receiving packets from flippers and making full on games. The only thing we don't have is a way to send the packets. So let's look at that real quick. Um, so sending is actually pretty straightforward. The stuff I've seen is saying to use a UTF-8. I guess it's maybe there's Unicode concerns or something. I personally have seen from my demo stuff that everything was fitting in that lower ASCII, the kind of A to Z, zero to nine symbol spaces, um, which UTF-8 and ASCII at that point are the same. So I'm not doing any translation. I'm just calling string get C stir with the buffer that, that I want and making a message with it. And then when I have the message, I make sure that it's gonna fit. I get the length and I make sure it's gonna fit in the max length. If it's not, like I said about at the last spot, remember the length start at zero, so, or the index starts at zero. So we minus one to get to the last spot. We put a null, minus two, put a slash in, minus two, that should be three. I'll fix that. Now I'm not sure which one's correct. Well, I'll have to look at that. I think this is supposed to be three. Anyway, I'll update the, this document with the correct answer. Uh, cool. And then at that point, we call this method sub gigahertz TX RX worker, right? We pass in the thing that we allocated. We pass in our array of message and we pass in the length of that message. So if the length exceeded, we do set it to the max. So this length is actually the length that we want to send. Um, so that's how you send messages. And then this is how you receive messages. Um, and then the third video, I'm going to walk through this C file and show the application itself. Um, and then go ahead and check back here for the latest edits since clearly my video has some uh, mistakes in it. So great. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the third video.